Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Experience the world of video games as never before. Welcome everyone to February 1982. We last left off with the Campaign Trilogy on the Apple II. It was kind of an Apple night last time. Let's see what's happening now. Our next game is... Galactic Encounters for the IBM PC or MS-DOS, PC boot or IBM compatible, whatever you want. Galactic Encounters is another Star Trek variant, but has a few twists. This one has no box, we have no other artwork we can check out, but we do have the game. Let's boot up and play Galactic Encounters release at the end of February, the cusp end of February. So this is by Microproductions Incorporated. What level of play do you want? Well, we're... Pretty novices when it comes to this style of game, and you'll see why. It's a Star Trek variant because it doesn't use any license for Star Trek. The Kaon and Omegan Empires have united their forces in a full-scale attack against the Consortium of Planets. As commander of the Iliad, one of the few Class Seven or Class Eight star cruisers in the fleet, you must defend the galaxy in which you are currently stationed. Your orders are to destroy all Kaon forces, not Klingon forces. You may also defend yourself against Omegan Raiders, not Romulans that you encounter. Consortium intelligence sources have observed Kaon ships of various strengths, including ships nearly as powerful as your Class 8 Star Cruiser. Also, the Omegans have perfected a cloaking device, which makes it impossible for you to detect them with your long-range sensors. Again, they're not Romulans. The Iliad is needed to defend other galaxies, thus it is crucial that your mission be completed within the allotted time. A galactic combination awaits you and your crew upon successful completion of this mission. Honor to the Consortium! So there you go, it is obviously taking reference to Star Trek, but not necessarily saying it's Star Trek. So when the game begins, you'll see the familiar scene if you're used to the Star Trek strategy game. You have commands you'll be typing in. Right here above my shoulder is the long range and short range scans. It has a, a various quadrants you can go to in different places. Like for example, if I type help, it's going to give me the list of commands I can say. Now, the reason this game has a twist is you notice down in the bottom right corner, you have the Z-Ray for Galactic Encounters. It is like the death weapon. Uh, it, it is the ultimate we weapon that'll destroy an entire quadrant and has the ability to possibly destroy you. So it's supposed to be used sparingly or in a situation where you might not get out. But you can see for the list of commands, you have uh, the, your, your shields, damage report, changing your condition from red to green, docking on planets. And one of the biggest twists that this has compared to the other Star Trek variants we've seen thus far is the bases where you refuel can be destroyed by the Kaon forces. And if the bases are destroyed, you actually go to planets, mine planets for dilithium crystals. They still have the word phaser. They still have the word photon. You can you can tell Star Trek is, is here in this game. It's just adding another slightly uh, level of complexity to all the other Star Trek variants we've played. With the uh, additional fighter power, uh, the attacking still very similar to the other ones we've seen. But... Um, you can see we have to, different crystals having the power of using our warp drive and so forth. But now, since bases can be destroyed, you have to think about the movements of your enemies, killing them before they get to a base, and then if they do, where you can go to get resources when you run out. So uh, this is obviously a very complex game. This is another one that we can't just jump in and play for a few seconds to give you the full feel of it. But uh, for all the other Star Trek variants or strategic games for the time, I would say this one is just on average of, of everything we've seen up to this point. On an IBM PC, it would have been really expensive to go back to 1982 in February and play this, which still would have cost you quite a bit. You can see that we didn't have any artwork. I don't even know for sure if this was a box, but Galactic Encounters is a perfectly average game for 1982, especially if you want to play something strategic. And with that, let's press on and see our next game. We're next headed to the arcade, and this is Leprechaun. Leprechaun has several different game variants. Or I shouldn't say variants. I mean, there's different styles of this game when it's called, even though it's called Leprechaun. Let's take a look at the artwork for Leprechaun. The one we're going to be checking out is by Moppet Video. And you can see in the top left corner, it, this is the one designed for smaller children between the ages of three and six. But the original game was called Pot of Gold. And that one was very difficult, so they just kind of dumbed down the difficulty, and there you have Leprechaun. It's the exact same game. And you can see on the advertising flyer, the, the perfect game for a youngster. 
The player is a little boy in the forest searching for the golden treasure. A nasty leprechaun is pursuing the player. Leprechaun keeps moving the treasure to different hiding places. Player gains points by running through the forest and touching the trees. Temporary escape from the leprechaun is possible by running into the cottages in the forest. Bonus points are awarded when the player finds the treasure and escapes the evil leprechaun. Each phase is slightly different. They kind of randomize the trees and how the, how the screen looks. And you can see in the very bottom what this system looks like. It's kind of a cabaret or a mini arcade cabinet meant to be for smaller children. And there's the example, another one of the arcade cabinet. For the control panel, we have, I believe, an eight-way joystick. And that's it. No other controls, right? Yeah, it's just moving around on the screen. That's all you got. There's the, the arcade marquee for Leprechaun. Now, typically, if it was for kids only, we'd be bypassing it. But the original game was not this way. So for the different versions, the, I think it's Pacific uh, Neo Technical that did the original developing development of this game. And then GPI picked it up and released Pot of Gold, but it was very, very difficult. And we could play that one, but because we're not the experts of the game, we're going to be playing the Leprechaun version because that one's the easier one to actually, while I'm explaining the game and running around, the Leprechaun won't get me every second. All right, so let's go to the arcade and play Leprechaun. Originally by Pacific Polytechnical, it's February 25th, 1982. And we're in. They even have a Hall of Fame for this, that's nice. So just imagine you're playing on a mini arcade cabinet, not a full-size one. A full-size upright, at least. And you can see on the bottom left, it says Tong Electronic. It is beyond me where Tong Electronic has come from, but whether it's another name, because I couldn't find much information on that. The, the different versions, though, I know it's been published by GPI, and I know that it's been sent, uh, created by uh, the uh, Pacific Polytechnical. You control the sleuth. Your goal is to get the pot of gold. The leprechaun will try to catch you and keep you from getting the pot. And whenever you run across these different trees or objects on the map, you get points for it. So as you move around searching for the pot of gold, you get points for the longer you stay alive if the leprechaun doesn't get you. When the pot of gold does appear, then you just hop into the pot of gold and move on to the next round. Easy, easy enough. Yeah, I don't remember seeing this one. And I have seen this kind of style of arcade, the mini upright arcade cabinet. All right, let's put a coin in and see what Leprechaun is like. Somewhere in the Forest of Kells. Maybe they meant to say Hells. So you can see as I'm running around, the Leprechaun is chasing me. And this version, the Leprechaun version, is very slow. In the other one, Pot of Gold, the Leprechaun is extremely fast. It is a total quarter guzzler, but as you move around, you're making more and more points, and then whenever you're ready, you go pop, pop in the pot, <laughs> and move on to the next round. So the longer you last or survive, the more points you get. This first round, we didn't get any homes, but we definitely ranked up the points, racked them up. Somewhere in the forest of Connemara. All right, so we got some homes that we can hide in. What happens if we go inside? Oh, and nice, it's to warp, to warp from one home to the other. So the pot, pot of gold is back there, and the warp only works for a certain amount of time. You can see it turned a different color. Let's see if it turns back. Oh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and he got me. We're back in the forest of Connemara. So in the way, you're playing a, a gambling game, if, if you want to think of it as a lo loose sense, because the longer you can stay arri arrive and touch the trees gives you higher points. So you're building up your pot with touching more and more trees to get more points, and then whenever you're ready, you dive into the pot. So you can just jump in right from the beginning. Somewhere in the forest of Cork. So the top of the screen shows us where the pot of gold is. So I can just jump in. Oh, the le what is the leprechaun doing? Oh, he's moving the pot. Okay. So we warped, tricked him, and we jump in. And as long as you don't die, you just keep amassing higher and higher wealth. So teaching those youngsters how to gamble. When is it time to quit? When do you need to get away? See, I just go, oh, nope. Not even going to chance it, just jump in the pot. You can do that if you wanted to. Somewhere in the forest of Munster. As far as gameplay and replayability, at this point, the maze craze is upon us. There's lots of arcade games that are taking Pac-Man's formula. We've already seen Mrs. Pac-Man and, and several other variants. So this is different that it's not a maze, but it's still a top-down view. Maybe a slightly different angle if, if you wanted to 
give it a little bit of credit, but the idea of it's it's it's, it's very similar to games we play where you chase someone else or the computer is, is another object or a pixel that, that runs after you and chases you around the stage. That's basically what it is, just with better graphics. So as far as gameplay goes, it's really not doing anything very impressive. It just looks a little bit better and more appealing, obviously, to kids to play in the arcade. But you're just playing tag with a leprechaun. That, that's basically the idea. And, and how far can you go? So that may, might be the, the biggest draw is let's see what next level draws, what forest we're going to go to, and what we'll see... Oh, and wait, now we don't have a pot of gold anywhere. So this is... The further you get, is they're going to make it harder? <laughs> yeah, they're going to make the levels harder for the leprechaun to chase after you. Not as much variety. I'm also getting a, a hum that's <laughs> just playing in the background. Oh, there it is. I found it. As soon as you find it, you can move to the next round. But it's like, it looks like it was just hiding behind a tree. Thanks, Chiptune. So there you go. That is leprechaun or pot of gold. Of the two different versions we've seen, it's actually for an arcade game, I'd say around average, maybe two and a half stars. I could say, I could say subpar if you think of all the other arcade games we've seen. It, do, it doesn't have as much substance with the gameplay. Moving from level to level and randomizing the trees is, is, an, is, is an idea that makes it enjoyable, but I wouldn't say enough to push above average. So I'll say three stars considering every game we've seen up to this point. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Here we go. This is Microbe for the Apple II. Another very, very interesting game. Another one I've never heard of before doing the channel. Let's take a look at the box for Microbe. This is by Synergistic Software. If you look at the top right of the box, it's by Alan H. Zalta, MD, a medical doctor, and then Robert C. Clardy, a new edu venture. So this one is the, is this edutainment? Is this educational? Is this arcade? Where's the line? That's what this game wants to you, you to see. We have an alternate version of the box where they just cut out the doctor. They still call it an edgy uh, venture, but if you didn't want it to be <laughs> blatant that the doctor designed the game, you can use this front of the box, I guess. And then inside the box, you had different charts because this is a strategy game slash arcade game. This is charts to find your way through the human body because the way the game is played, they give you a diagnosis of a person and then you, s you go into a, a craft that gets miniaturized, very tiny. You go inside the person's body and then you have to decide where to navigate as if you're on a, a ship in, the, in, in space, but inside someone's body, where to go in the body and how to fix this person or heal this person. It's very s f f uh, familiar to Fantastic Voyage. So it's, it's the idea as a video game, but but in an educational sense. Yes, this is before Intellivision's Microsurgeon. I don't remember off the top of my head if this is, if it's in 82 or not. If it is, then we'll be seeing it soon. Yes, now this does have the speech, and I, I believe we have it in, but will we get to the point where they actually talk a lot to us is the question, because this game is one that you can spend a massive amount of time with. Lots of replayability because it has different scenarios of people that have problems and you have to go in the body to, to fix those. And it plays very much like a strategic game that you're playing in space, that you need to uh, move to a different quadrant or a part of the body, to decide what organ you want to enter, how you want to enter, and then uh, what, uh, what, what problems that come to the ship that you have to take care of the crew that you have. Very similar to playing like a Star Trek game, but on a way different scale. So these are the other things we have inside the box. We have the physician's reference, uh, blood samples, the technician's manual, because not only are you going to be playing the surgeon or the the, the, the professor that's going to be uh, the medical doctor, but you also have to play as a technician or the person in charge of the ship, keeping the ship. Uh, you can see like uh, the hull, sonar, uh, radio, compass, fuel tank. It's all part of the, this game. All right, so we have the manual for Microbe. It is very, very lengthy. But yes, a good eye on the Mockingbird speech and sound enhanced. I don't know if we're going to get that far to see that, but a uh, good point. It, it, it does make this game a little more impressive because of that. Yes, Laser Surgeon came out in 1987, so this is way, way ahead of its time. And honestly, I thought, is this an educational game or an action game? But it's actually a little of both. It has a little bit of arcade, a little bit of strategic, and the educational side of it, too. All right, so Microbe, the anatomical adventure. With assistance by Alan H. Zalda, medical doctor. 
All right, so this one is a computer program directed at a number of device diverse users with differing goals. The best way to describe Microbe is to do it twice. So they describe Microbe the game and Microbe the educator, if you're the parent who wants them to be educated. Microbe is an action-packed, exciting adventure game in which you plan and execute a complex mission in an environment that's both familiar and utterly alien, the human body. While the places and objects and hazards you face have familiar names, you've never seen them from this point of view. Strategic planning, adventure-like problem-solving, and arcade-fast action response are all required to make your way through the, the maze of vessels in the body to the brain. Can you accomplish your mission in time and save critically injured patients while fending off uh, attacking bacteria, parasites, dodging clots and tumors? Only time will tell. And then the educator side. It's an educational simulation of both the human body and its contents and the operation of sophisticated research submarine. The information presented in Microbe on a wide variety of topics is designed to be both interesting, challenging to students from grade school up to college and to medical students. Now, I preface that. This game gets extremely detailed with the medical information. I've played edutainment titles that deal with you know, the human body and going inside the body, but this one is the, the biggest. And obviously, we're playing every single video game. This is also one of the first to do that. They give you diagnoses as if you were a, uh, a doctor trying to figure out how to heal the, the patient. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it is getting a remake. Yeah. So this one may, might be the granddaddy, if you want to call it that. You'll see whenever you boot it up, though. It is very, very different. So the original design of Micro was done by both uh, Alan H. Zalda, the physician and resident at University of Arkansas, and has a lot of information about the anatomy of the human body. So this game is also slightly an encyclopedia, giving you information that if you wanted to learn about the human body. So they break down the scenario. This takes place in the future. The future of January 14th, 1990. A secret government po project was finally completed where they can miniaturize a device that could shrink down to the size of a, a, a cell to insert in, in, go into the human body. So in November, in November 1990, the organization formed a monitor miniaturization surgery activities. And the, the organization was called the MICRO, Miniaturization International Centralized Research Organization. So that's the basis of the game, that we're in the future in 1990. And then it explains how to get started and play the game. Whenever you begin, it's going to give you scenarios that you can pick from, or if you want to customize it, you can. And that's what we'll be doing. We're going to customize a variation of play where you can pick your players. You can play from uh, one player, or you can play multiple people that have different roles in the ship to help you out. You also have the background. Do you want to play the game as a gamer, a student, or a physician? So you can play this game as if you were a medical doctor. Blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, Operation should be out, the board game, right? It's 1982. I, I think it would be out by now. All right, so, so someone looked that up. Is Operation out while, while we're playing this in February 1982? And then we also have the skill level. How difficult do you want this to be? And I think three is the... Yeah, it's three is like playing if you were a medical doctor. And then if you want the Apple to talk or not, you can say uh, if you have the, the attached peripheral, you can make... It talk back to you. And then you, what emphasis do you want to play the game on? You want to play with health and safety or medicine. So you have two different modes there. And then to play the game. With one or more players, Microbe is altered. Less information is provided by the ship's computer requiring players to make use of the various handbooks during the mission. Because in the box, this is the main manual. But if you played with more people, people would, one of your friends would have the technician manual and be reading about the technician. Another person would have the physician's manual. So everyone would have different roles they would play if you played with more than one. Oh, yeah, way old. Yeah, I kind of figured. <laughs> All right, so whenever you first begin the game, I think they give you an example. Okay, yeah, they, they show you that a first case comes up, and you can decide to do that case or make your own case. After you accept the case, then you it, it breaks down what kind of issues you can have and how to fix them. So you can see they have uh, brain lesions, damaged sites, and where you need to go in the brain once you get there. And then to play the game itself, this picture explains what you'll see or what you'll look at. It's kind of a menu-based game where you decide which place, place you want to navigate into the body. And then after you go there, then you determine what you're going to do to, 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 to fix them. Commanding the microbe. I, I am not a medical doctor, but I can imagine this game would be so fascinating if that's what you were interested in. And this explains how do you command the microbe. As the captain, navigator, technician, and physician. So I believe you can play four people at the same time 
they all have different roles. I don't, I don't know how you just cry, maybe you cry on the keyboard to play. It breaks down the, the roles here on the left side, and then what the master view screen means, what your commands are, just like we played with other tactical strategy games. You have to know what to type in to command the ship, where to go in the body. And then once you get to different places, how you attack and use the weapons of the ship. All right, so this manual, like I said, is very, very lengthy. It is right in between of, is this educational or is this a video game? So here we go. Let's see. This is Microbe. It is February 27th, 1982. And by Synergistic Software, we got the edutainment title, Microbe. So look, look at the bottom. It's August 3rd, 1992 in the future when we could miniaturize ourselves to the size of a cell. So I want to do any other key because we want to do a new case. And then now you can say the options you want. How many players do we want? What kind of background? We want to be a gamer instead of a student or a physician. Oh, but this has up to five. So five people can be playing this, uh, working together at the same time. And then what skill level do you want? We're going to keep it novice, but we're only going to be playing for a little bit. And then do we want a talking apple? Yeah, we got the peripheral in. Let's see if it talks to us. And then we want the emphasis on we'll do health and safety. And then I think that's it. Let's go. Now it gives us different people and which people we want to help. So this would be an example of someone named Abby Bombick. Their age, their occupation, looks like they smoke light. They are female, no alcohol. They have a benign monoclonal gammopathy and they're allergic to chlorophor chl chlorophyll told you I wasn't a physician. Chlorophyll the victim was riding a motorcycle on the freeway. A motorcycle struck a piece of wood in the freeway. Victim lost control of the key and crashed. Victim was not wearing a helmet and sustained massive head injury. So we get to go help them. If you don't want this one, then you just push any key. And it goes to another one. Oh, this gives more information on it. Nice. And if you want to pick a different file, then you just push spacebar. For... Uh, for brevity, we're just going to continue forward. And now we, we say we, we are going to try to help this person. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, we'll go to the lungs and chop off a lung. Very nice presentation. We're being miniaturized because it's the future in 1990. We're in. So this is it. We are in the game now. And if we want to go to a different place... It's uh, it's all real time, so you can see we have a, a clock that's ticking down, and we have different directions that, believe it or not, we can control our compass over on the, the right side above my head with the joystick, the Apple joystick. And if we want to go somewhere, ends for navigation, tells us where we want to go. Navigator now says, all right, uh, we want to go to the head. Let's go. Now we're in. We want to travel to the head, and now it says which part do we want to go to. And you move yourself around different parts of the body, attacking and uh, uh, diagnosing the person's Ill illnesses and fixing them or repairing them. But you do need to follow a lot of paperwork. So it is, it, it is extremely complex. Oh, wait, can we go to a different place? Let's go to the kidneys. Or where's the lungs? Let's go to lungs. And then I want to go here, right? And from this place, I'm not going to be able to play as long because this game, this thing takes a very long time to get into. Because not only do we need to know what we're doing with the ship and how the ship commands, but we also need to know how do we help these people in the game. But uh, there you go. Just an example of the game Microbe. Of all the games we played up to this point, man, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty complex. It's a game that you could really play for a long time. So I'd say of all the games we've seen up to this point, it's, it's above average for sure. It's interesting that they're combining the uh, technical side of it, controlling a ship that's shrunk down to a small size. But <laughs> yeah, I just saw the chat. Yeah, I was going to say because of how original it is, I'm, I'm thinking around four, because even if you weren't into the, uh, the educational side of it, it's still really fun that you get to play it this way. And of, of all the games we've seen up to this point, to play a video game based on Fantastic Voyage... This one does a really good job of it. Exceptional job. So there you go. There's Microbe for the Apple II. Yeah. Even though we don't play a lot of educational titles on here, we still appreciate them.
All right, here we go. Let's press forward and see our next game. We've now entered the realm of at some point in February 1982. And this is our first one. We're on the TRS-80 color computer. This is Antiballistic Missile Command, or ABM. We have no box for this one, just a few screenshots. So let's pop up and play. This one's originally by Chromaset. At some point in February 1982. And if it says Missile Command, I'm expecting Missile Command, right? We're going to load this up in basic. Everyone just bask in that cocoa green glow. At least while it lasts. <laughs> oh, the backlog games, yeah. Yeah, there's a ton of ones. I heard they're really good on the Wii. All right, Antiballistic Missile Command. Emergency, emergency. Long-range radar ind indicates an attack of unknown forces of intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's your job to destroy the incoming waves of bombs with a fleet of ABMs. You have to use the joystick, position the cursor over a bomb, and fire the ABM before any incoming ICBMs make it to the bottom of the city. So it is Missile Command. Yes. Wasn't let down. Now, this one's played with the analog joystick on the Coco. I wouldn't play this on a self-centering one. Like, when we played Polaris, the way to go is pretending like you're playing Missile Command in the arcade. How many ICBMs? All right, let's try three, I guess, right? You can have up to 20? That's crazy. Oh, the Coco Green Glow is gone. Oh, so tapes... We're pretty spoiled here. We usually get the disc version. And we're in. So I'm controlling the cursor with the joystick. And it is it is working the way I would expect. It does feel a little bit slower because the, the when you move the cursor around and you're about to fire, it the, the flicker doesn't give you as much precision as you, you would expect. Plus... Notice when the missile is coming down that I, it, it's following dots and it's hard to determine exactly where it is or where to place it. But for the games we've seen on the Coco that uh, they, they don't have as impressive as a frame rate. Oh, see, I, I thought I got that one. Still didn't get it. <laughs> Let me try uh, leading it a little bit further. Yeah, it's still going. So it's blowing up part of it, but it's not... Go, go, go. Did I get him now? No, I still haven't got him. There we go. Yeah, that's a little frustrating unless... It feels like I'm aiming on it. The, the, so the control for the cursor is working correctly. The way that it hits and explodes the missile, though, is, isn't on point. <laughs> oh, that's right, because it's basic. But even the slow cursor because of basic is all right. It's the the aim of when it uh, usually you're used to seeing something that's not just a series of dots coming down. It's a little bit easier to see. Oh, did we run out? We got three different silos. Is it like the? Uh... All right, there you go. So that is ABM, Anti-Ballistic Missile Command. I would say it's got a, some big shoes to fill after we played Polaris, which was incredible as a Missile Command variant you could play on your home computer. Uh, I wouldn't say it, it's actually close to being bad because of the aim and the fire. Uh, the cursor works great, even though it was running on basic a little slow, but the it, it's run on the cusp of, is it a bad game considering other computer games, or is it just subpar? Uh, if chat wants to help me out, I might be able to go two stars for ABM uh, because we've seen other home computer video games that make a, a better missile command than this, definitely. <laughs> yeah, the dots didn't help at all. Yeah, we'll go we'll go one and a half. It, it's right in the range of bad. One and a half or two stars. We played plenty of missile command games and competitions high in 1982. All right, with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're next on the Atari home computer. This is Birth of the Phoenix. Which sounds so impressive, but it really is not as impressive as you'd think. Let's take a look at the artwork for Birth of the Phoenix. This is a Class 1 tutorial adventure. It sounds epic, but this is a beginner adventure game. 
And there's the ad for Birth of the Phoenix. I want you. Phoenix Software is looking for state-of-the-art IBM, Atari, and IBM PC. We can offer you top... Oh, they're trying to get people to work for them. You want a job with Phoenix Software? There's our five and a quarter floppy disk for Birth of the Phoenix. By Phoenix Software, aptly named. And we got the manual for this one. Scanned in very high resolution, which is rare for the time. But this is the Atari manual. Looks like we needed 32K to run this. Goes for 22 bucks in 1982. Now, this is a manual pretty much on how to play an adventure game. What an adventure game is. Not the first time we've seen it on the channel. <laughs> Look at the, the, the dedication. For all of the adventurers out there, the joys, the frustrations, and the ultimate solutions that are waiting for you to discover. Oh, yes. But mostly frustrations. At least now, in February 1982. <laughs> we got some comical art on the left side here. Adventurers Wanted. So this is what we've seen in a few magazine publications on Webster defines an adventure as an exciting and dangerous undertaking, an unusual, stirring, often romantic experience. Wait, what? Romantic? What kind of adventure are we playing here? It uses semi-intelligent word recognition. Computer programs will be transported to worlds of wonder and amazement. To worlds where only survivors are those that can live by their wits, using every ounce of imagination and common sense, which is at their disposal. The universe of an adventure game consists of an original grouping of locations bound together by a central theme, like the Old West, underground caves, or a haunted castle. And then they said, The adventures of today are loosely based on a program developed by Will Crowther and Don Woods, Stanford University, written a few years ago. <laughs> right now they say a few years ago. That's really funny. They're talking about Colossal Cave Adventure, the original adventure. Required over 300K of memory storage. Wow. Incredible. So this manual is not just telling you how to play Birth of the Phoenix, but also just saying what is an adventure game and how do you do it? How do you communicate with the computer? Most adventure games describe the situation on the screen or show you a picture on and ask you a question. What do you want to do now? And you can type in go east, get rabbit, kill someone, go door. Birth of the Phoenix are set up to recognize verb followed by a noun. So this is a two-word text parser. And then how do you make the computer understand? Yes, how do you make the computer understand? Most often heard complaint from new adventure players is, I know what I want to do, but I can't seem to communicate it to the computer. Yes, it's like you understand us, Phoenix Software. To a beginning player, this is very frustrating. Can often sour, often sour a person who would otherwise become a great adventure player. All those adventure players that were soured because they couldn't couldn't tell the computer what to do. For example, if you came across a card reading machine and wanted to, to read a card you were carrying, what would you type in? In most cases, read card would not work because most programs would interpret read card as I would like to read the card with my eyes. You would receive a message such as there is nothing on the card to read. What we really want to do then is put the card into the machine and have the machine read the card. But how do we say it in two words? Put card would also not work because most programs equate put with drop. Many times the clue on what verb to use will be given in a way the machine or card is described in the game. For instance, if you look machine, the description is, it is a large black and blue machine with a slot into which cards may be inserted. Then it's a good bet that the verb you should try is insert. Or it may be that you look card to get the message. So they're trying to be helpful here, and that, that is true because adventure games at this time already have, you type help or you type hint, and they will help you while you play the game. Thankfully, a few years before when we played adventure games, when we were in farther in the Dark Ages, we, were, we didn't have that luxury. But even then, they still can be very, very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's what you ended up doing, just putting all the swear words you could into the adventure game. Now he explains how to walk around, which this is kind of like before we played our first adventure game on the channel, we should have read this manual of how do you move around? Use the cardinal directions. And then it gives you helpful hints. This game is similar to High Res Adventure Zero Mission Asteroid that Online Systems did, which was supposed to be a beginner adventure game. And they did the same thing in their manual, breaking it down, what an adventure game is, how you communicate with a computer and so forth. So this has lots of stuff. Location descriptions, object descriptions, how do you save the game, which is a big part of, the, part of it. And I don't know for sure if this was made for uh, a younger audience or not, but it's still very, very helpful. Like uh, this one is talking about the objects of the game or objects in general, how you use objects in a, a adventure game. And then do you smell smoke? Other magic you can use, how to cast spells, open and shut cases, how to uh, open safes, 
open doors, meeting people, how to talk to people, and then digging up things. So this one, even though it's a two-word text parser, it's still a very uh, lengthy, uh, deep t adventure game. Just It's supposed to be more simple to play. And of course, maze mapping. Got to draw mazes. Get that grid paper out. And treasures, which they've been doing since Colossal Cave Adventure. Got to go get the treasure, bring it back to a certain spot, and that's where you get your points. And very helpful. I love it when the manuals have this. The verb and noun commands that it accepts. Sometimes you can even get the a card that comes with it that has everything possible that they programmed in. Then you'll know exactly what you just look down the verb, so which one you want to want to use. All right, there you go. That's what we got into playing Birth of the Phoenix. Is everyone ready? All right, here we go. It is sometime in February 1982. We got Birth of the Phoenix by Paul L. Berker. Way to go, Paul. This one's another fantasy game, not just a uh, colossal cave ripoff. It has a little bit more substance to it. Welcome to Adventuring. You're about to leave the ordinary everyday world to inhabit and enter a new world, a world where magic works and things aren't quite what they seem. This is an um, interesting dichotomy between video games because at this point, there wasn't this mix of fantasy and arcade or action. There was a total separation like this. If you were playing this game, you had to consider yourself, I'm in a new world. I'm playing an adventure game where I want to experience what this world has while using you know text and, and commands. Very different from the world of let's go to the arcade and play a video game. So you had lots of fans of this at the time. If you weren't one of them, I know you can just breeze by the video. An adventurer fresh from Murmisk said, he booted a disc, give it a try, I'm afraid I might die. Press return now at your own risk. All right. <laughs> You're in a dark forest glade. It's autumn and beautifully colored oak leaves crunched underfoot. There's a faint blue haze in the air and you can smell fragrant wood smoke. Overhead, a flock of geese wheel in the sky as they head for their winter nesting grounds. This is a very detailed written text adventure game. So you see at the top, they break it apart like the Scott Adams adventure games. You're in a forest glade. Objects are east and west, and we have a book. Nice. All right, so let's do east. And now we come upon the tool shed at the edge of the forest. The field where it's well maintained, it looks mowed. The tool shed, though, it's not been well kept up as its magenta paint is peeling. Very descriptive. Incredible. If it didn't have just the two-word text parser, this would be uh, an, an impressive text adventure game, at least for first uh, glance. All right, so let's get that shovel. I don't know how... Oh, get shovel. Some of these computers we play on, I got to type slower than modern computers. All right, we got the shovel. And now let's get flashlight. Got it. And it is updating the top screen. Very nice. And now let's go west. We're in the forest glade. Go west again. Still in the forest glade. Now we're deep in the forest. Towering trees block out the sun. One tree is truly majestic. At least 20 feet in diameter, carved into the living bark of the tree, are tiny, well-worn notches, which someone or something has used as steps. Well, let's climb it. Climb that tree. Now we're high up in a treetop. We've climbed as far as we can go. Only way left is down. You have a wonderful view from up here. Ah. Uh, now get branch. Okay, and we also have a net too, right? Yeah, this is the adventure game that you would definitely want to be playing. Yeah, interactive fiction is a great way to put it. Definitely L. Curtis B. Yeah, because we played adventure games that they just give you a quick description and you're just supposed to move where you need to go. We've also had ones that are very sprawling, like Zork, where you have a world that you're inhabiting, an actual world. This is what it feels like with this one. All right, so Birth of the Phoenix is another one we could go very lengthy and play. Uh, for first time we've we, we've played the game, and for reviews at the time, it was a introductory um, software by Phoenix Software, and they they did, did a very good job saying, "Here's what an adventure game is. Let us show you." Kind of holding your hand on the way. So I'll say three stars of all the games we've seen up to this point. I wouldn't say three and a half. Something with a graphic adventure game, Kabul Spy. I actually bumped up to three and a half after we finish the show, considering the other games we've seen. So I'll say three stars for Birth of the Phoenix. Very good for the time. And now, where are we going with the video game land? It's time to go to the arcade. This is Disco number one in 1982. Wasn't Disco dead by 1980? Let's see what we got for artwork for Disco number one. It's another one by... 
Data East on the Deco Cassette System. Win the beauty of the hall for fun and excitement. Dance at the Disco Ball. I guess. Now, this was released first in Japan on the Deco Cassette System. We flip it over in the back. Oh, it has the player guide. Dance a square around the disco characters. If it's erased or touched by a disco dancer, or you make a mistake, you can't complete the box. Avoid the ruffians. Push the red button to freeze them. Only a limited number of times per game. If your playboy touches the wine or glasses, his move will quicken. So drink more wine. It helps you pick up the ladies. <laughs> Very aptly put, uh, Chiptune. If you escape through the warp tunnels on the sides of the screen, returning from the entrance opposite... Uh, okay, so it wraps around. A witch appears when play's been going on for some time. Oh, just like Evil Auto. you got to have something that uh, takes those quarters, right? If your playboy's lost, if they're caught by the witch or the ruffian. So we're just supposed to pick up the disco girls, the beauty queens, and avoid the witches and the ruffians. Got it. There's the example of the arcade cabinet for disco number one. It has the same arcade cabinet that every other deco cassette system had. The same control panel overlay around the outside. And then we also have the system itself. There it is, the Deco. Data East cassette. And control panel looks like we have a four-way joystick with the special button. Do not forget the special button. Or, as the manual put it, that's the uh, red button. Oh, they just call it the red button? Okay. We'll call it the special button. It sounds better. All right, this one has a few different versions. It's also known as Sweetheart. So it's Disco Number 1 or Sweetheart, both on the Deco Cassette. We're going to play the standalone version so we don't have to wait for the Deco Cassette to load. So here we go. It is sometime in February 1982. We're in the arcade in Japan playing Disco Number 1. Yes. Let's do it. It better have some good disco music. Otherwise, uh, zero stars. We're in a track mode now. No music. It's going to show, yeah, how to play. Line of races, I guess, if one of the ruffians comes across it. Is that all they're showing how? Okay, so you, this is like looks like a combination of Amadar and Kix. Like they're putting those two games together, both of which we've seen. All right, let's put a coin in and go. Oh yeah, wine makes it makes you go faster, but I can't get. Where's my special button? There it is. Wait, we already have a witch. Go away, witch. Can we move to the next screen? Let's see. If I wrap up here. Yeah, okay, so you gotta wrap around the top and the bottom. But we already got a witch on our tail? No way. Yeah, it's a mixture of Amadar and Kicks is the best way to describe it. Ooh. Gotta get more wine so I can move faster. <laughs> the witch is a little unfair. Since when do you bring roller skates to the disco? Because that's what we're using right now. No, go away! <laughs> My special button doesn't do that much. Alright, we'll stick around that side. Uh oh. 20 seconds left. Oh, the witch removes the lines. Go away, witch. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I don't know if they counted that as the end of the level or not. But we now get different music, but I would hardly call this disco. Oh, I know that one. That song that was playing in the background, I've heard that somewhere before. Add that to the list of chronologically game public domain bingo. Oh, we can put our initials in. Nice. I missed the first one, so I'll just call myself R A R Z. Oh, they did? Well, I guess that shows my age, if there really was roller skates in the disco. I always think of Saturday Night Fever. But that's true. They did have roller skates at, in, in Saturday Night Fever, so yeah, it, it, it works. All right, let's put another coin in and play some more. Disco number one. All right, got to make this work. Get the, get the wine. You got to be so fast. And you also have the lines disappear after a certain amount of time, so you have to be quick to make yourself... 
They won't let you make a large square around who you're dancing. is relentless. <laughs> Maybe it is popcorn. <laughs> There's lots of elements we've seen from video games. An enemy that tries to destroy you to take your quarters at the end. It has you drawing a pattern around the screen to try to capture something or an area of the screen. But it also has enemies that move around. It even has the power, well not power up, but a button you can push. It's your get out of jail free card. But I'd say the four-way joystick doesn't do the game justice. That's because it was on the Deco. You had to, you had to incorporate the four-way joystick, and the, the the game does have diff, uh, different difficulty levels. So while it looks like it's very frustrating and hard, uh, it, you, can, you can change that with the dip switches in the back. I'd still say uh, it's around the average uh, range for all the games we've seen up to this point for an arcade game. It's not pushing anything any further. What's cool though is the incorporation of the two different genres. It's it's kicks mixed with Amadar, which, you know, are still fairly new for the time, but I really wouldn't want to call it an above average game because uh, the, the the gameplay is a little bit clunky with a four-way joystick. It doesn't feel as smooth, and the way that the, the line is going away faster and because of all the things on screen, it, it doesn't make it as, as, as fun of an experience, but I'll still say three stars for every game we've seen up to this point. All right, so there you go. That's disco number one. As we leave the arcade, I really want to stay in the arcade. Maybe not playing this one, but I mean, the arcade's where it's at. Let's see where we're going now. We're back on the Atari home computer. This is Game Show. Game Show. Get to use my Game Show voice. We don't have a box for this one. Just a few screenshots, but we have the manual. This one is by APX. Hung Fam did it. Way to go, Hung. Predict the most popular answers to questions in game show. Now, to preface this, there are plenty of trivia games that we that were in the arcades and lots of games on the mainframe that were quiz style games. But we didn't check out any mainframe games and a lot of the trivia games we didn't play either because of, of, of the nature of it. This is one of the first, if not the first video game that is doing a game show, not just random trivia or quiz. And you'll see what game show we'll be playing, but it's just called game show. I know there's plenty of games that have quiz or uh, answering questions before this, but this is the first one that is a game show game. Let's see what game show is all about. Welcome to game show. Just like a widely known television program. Oh, they're keeping it pretty generic. Game show tests your ability to predict the most popular answers to various questions. Everyone put in your guesses what game show we're going to play. <laughs> If you guess the most popular answer, you can try to guess all the correct answers before three misses, or you can elect for your opponent to try. If you miss a question, your opponent gets a chance. As you enter your guesses correctly, answers display in the appropriate order, and you earn points. This sounds really familiar. Uh, I know the way game show we're about to play, but uh, you'll see when we start. We boot it up. It has, comes with 200 questions and 1,155 answers. That's pretty impressive. You need 24K of RAM to play this one. You also need basic two Atari joysticks, and we'll plug the second one in. We have a printer. You can have a printer on this? <laughs> or equivalent 40-column printer? I wonder what the printer's for. Maybe when we do the one of the modes at the end? All right, how do we get started? We can uh, breeze by the loading instructions. The first display screen comes up and says, Welcome to Game Show. Push the start screen, and then what do you want for the time limit? Like, how long do you have before you answer questions? And you get to put that in, and then you start the face-off. You ask a question that scrolls across the bottom of the screen, and then the two players that are playing push the red button on your Atari joystick, and that's how you respond. And I guess you type in the answer. 
when it says go for it. If the other player jumps the gun and pushes it before, then the other player can get a chance to to take it. And then you say you want to go or pass, and I guess you push G or P to move on. Okay, I've already figured out what game we're going to play. So here we go. Let's pop it and play some game show. Released at some point in February 1982 by APX. Did they get a winner? APX is sometimes a gamble. We don't know what's going to happen. All right. So option, let's push option and see what happens. Welcome to the game show. We can play using your data file, add a data file, display file, print file. Okay, so this is just about the questions, I bet. All right, we'll just leave the menu. Got it. Let's go. Push and start. And what time limit do we want for every question? Uh, let's make it long. Can we do 120 seconds? All right, program's loading. Let's do a fast forward. Never mind that noise in the background. That's just the way it sounded to load games on your home computer. Very painful. It also was time consuming. Make yourself a sandwich, maybe a smoothie, and then the game loads. And we're in. Question number one. Name something you see at racetracks. Go for it. Uh, horse. Wait, it's not responding to my... The keyboard was not responding. Are we supposed to use the joystick for... Because I'm pushing the... Okay, there he goes. Let's try horse. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. So we're playing Family Feud. But it's not called Family Feud. It's called Game Show. But the very first video game that was a game show. Like an actual game show. So you could call this Family Feud if you wanted. But if you wanted to look it up on the Atari, it's called Game Show. Do we want to go? Oh, yeah. We're going. And name something you see at a racetrack. Let us answer, right? Yeah, we just answer in. Uh, something else you see. Uh, dog. Oh, no dog racetracks? <laughs> Thanks, Chiptune. I would have said dog. What else do you see at racetracks? Car, right? Yeah. What in the world? Are we supposed to say plural? <laughs> because car would... I would expect to see a car at a racetrack. They understood horse. Well, I want to try cars. There's no way. What in the world? All right, so now we go to the other side. They get to steal, possibly, the 60 points. <laughs> All right, we'll try jockey. Maybe they're only thinking... Yes, they're only thinking horse races, money, tickets, forms, <laughs> windows. <laughs> what? Yeah, never would have gotten that one. Hit either joystick button to continue. Now, usually I would breeze by this game a little faster, but come on. The first game show video game, and it's Family Feud. Oh, I missed the question. What did you have for dinner? All right, we'll say uh, beef. It's what's for dinner. Oh, I guess it's not what's for dinner. Name what comes with a lobster dinner. Okay. It helps to pay attention to the, the crawl. All right. Uh, butter for sure, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Answer as much as you can. Can we just type in? No, you got to wait for the text crawl. So that's a little annoying. They don't just say the, 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 the question. It has to scroll across the screen. All right. Let's put bib. Yes. Number two. What comes with a lobster dinner? Show me mashed potatoes. Potatoes. Oh, no. <laughs> Claw cruncher thingy? I don't know if they'll take that one. Show me claw cruncher thingy. Uh, cra cruncher? No, it's called the... The, the the what you break the we got plenty of time got 120 seconds but it's what yeah it's what you break uh, the lobster apart to open it up um the other thing I would say would be does it understand two words no I guess it doesn't not green beans all right well you get the idea playing with two people though in 1982 would have been very fun so game show first of its kind oh man but not licensed. 
I'm kind of glad that we're not in a licensed world that everything and ev everything and everything is on television or movies and video games. It's all original. It's kind of refreshing. All right. So for game show of all the games we've seen to this point, a two player game like this that you can type in, I would say uh, first of its kind, we'll do three and a half stars. It's above average. It is still a game show and quiz or trivia, but, but still enjoyable and above average. Definitely. All right. So with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Oh, yes. This is High Res Adventure number four, Ulysses and the Golden Fleece for IBM. For MS-DOS. Let's take a look at the box. Ulysses and the Golden Fleece. Yes. The version we've already seen a few other times before. This is the first time we're seeing it on the IBM. And there's the ad. Ulysses comes to IBM because they loved it on the Apple and Atari. And we did. By Sierra Venture. Or I guess that's the moniker they use. But it's Sierra Online. And we got the manual here for Ulysses and the Golden Fleece. Originally by Bob Davis and Kitten Williams on the Apple II. They have the story of Ulysses taking lots of liberties. It's not really based on anything historical. We're not playing an, uh, an educational game here. So it tells us about plotting our progress. After we hear the story of Ulysses and the Golden Fleece. Yes, just like we did before, Jason is still rolling in his grave after this. Hercules is part of this for some reason. I don't know how that ha that worked. They give, it, give us an example of how to draw maps at the time. And then some friendly advice before you embark on your journey. Check your inventory. Do you have everything you need? Oh, it's a hint for such a long voyage. As with many classical Greek heroes, you'll be required to perform certain superhuman feats and use magical substances to overcome malicious gods and evil creatures. Logic will not always work because the gods are not always logical. <laughs> uh, that's just a way to get out of these puzzles do not make sense, basically. All right, so we are going in. Popping the disc into place, Ulysses and the Golden Fleece, at some point in February 1982. Now, this is kind of cool that I get to show this off. This game allows you to switch between pictures and text only with F1 key, but it also allows you to see composite and RGB mode. So we get to see both composite and RG RGB at the click of a button, which is kind of cool. And we also have inventory and look room. So F1, F2, F5, and F6 are the big ones. Another thing, too, is you have to use the left control key to scroll text to be able to type in, which is a little bizarre. All right, let's go. After a bunch of jarbled text, Sierra Online, official Sierra, yes. We're beginning Sierra, uh, a world where Sierra exists. And this one is implemented by Jeff Stevenson for the IBM. Way to go, Jeff. Are you ready for the Golden Fleece on the IBM? I don't know if you're ready. Oh yeah, look at the high-res graphics. You're on a three-way road in a small town in ancient Greece. There is a store to the west with a fence next to it. Now, if we wanted to see just text, you push F1, it gives another garbled screen, but there you go. We see only text and no graphics. Want to switch back? <gasps> Boom! And you're like, oh no, the system's messed up. But no, it eventually comes through. But the cool part is going from composite to RGB. Let's check it out. RGB composite. RGB composite. Ooh, yeah. Look at the high-res graphics. The uh, epitome of, like, the highest mode. And what's, what's kind of cool is the, the most impressive uh, game that required the most memory at the time, which was Microsoft Decathlon, was in this mode. That's why it looks kind of similar to what we saw when we played that on the IBM. But we'll stay in composite for now. All right, so there's a fence next to it. Let's go south. We're on the outskirts of a small town. Road needs, leads north and west. You see a castle in the distance to the west. So that means let's go west. Oh, we got to continue with... That's right, control. So we'll go west. We're outside the king's castle facing west. And... West. Now we're in the entry hall of the king's castle. There's a guard here and exit is to the east. So now we say... Talk guard. Are you Ulysses? You're in the entry hall of the King's Castle. There's a guard and an exit to the east. And we say, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're named after the game. You bet. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to get into all the different graphics modes because we're going to be able to showcase everything on the, the home computer or at least watching the, the, the PC through the ages. So I, I was thrilled just to go back from back and forth from composite to RGB. But we're going to see a lot more than that on the show. 
The king's expecting you. I will escort you. I think you'd better bow. You're in the king's throne room. So we bow. The king accepts this humble gesture and says, There is legendary fleece of gold far off to the north. I, uh, I give you some gold and silver and a ship to complete your voyage. Return home with the fleece. You take the gold and silver... And then the guard escorts you back out of the palace. You're outside the king's castle facing west. Now, when I first booted this up and played the IBM version, it was a little bizarre because every time you want the screen to scroll, like right now, it doesn't respond on anything on the keyboard. And I actually thought something was broken. But on the IBM version, you have to hit the left control to move <laughs> to move the scroll forward. And now you can see all my jarbled text that I just typed in. I don't understand the word. All right, so now let's go east. We're in the King's Vineyard. Man, those high-res graphics look so good. Now we're in the outskirts of town. We go east again. And now let's go north. Oh, gotta scroll. We're on the three-way road again. And go west to the end of the store. You're in a store. There are doors to the east and north. And a sign is here. And here you can read the sign. And if you've seen the other versions that we played on Ulysses and the Golden Fleece, We've done this several times before, gone out to see. It is a, a great game for the time. The biggest, best, well, arguably the best game that's by Sierra at this point is Time Zone, which is a massive game. But Ulysses and the Golden Fleece is still a great find if you had an IBM PC back in the day. And so for all the games we've seen up to this point, we're still going to say Ulysses and the Golden Fleece is an above average game. Three and a half stars for sure. I could even say higher four stars because it's on the IBM, but eh, it's debatable. For 1982, though, it is uh, and it's an above average game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is where we put our video game playing on pause. Everybody push pause. We'll keep going playing the rest of releases at some point in February 1982, possibly finishing February 1982 next episode. We're really excited. That's it for today. And like I always say... When you can't play a game that uses true mythology, just throw Jason and Hercules in and you'll be just fine. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.